In a spirit of enterprise and innovation, uh, we are simultaneously transcribing this lecture using some technology from Microsoft. Uh, you can download it yourself at translate.it, translate it. And um, it's inevitable that the transcription will have some errors in it. I expect you can see them now. And for me, of course, that, that will lead to some confusion because you will suddenly start laughing for no apparent reason. <laughs> but I feel it's important if you're going to give a lecture on speech processing that you should at least have a go at doing some speech recognition. So we're using uh, here one of the best systems in the world, the Microsoft um, system. One of the nice things about this system is it will translate into multiple languages. So if you wanted this lecture available to you in Mandarin or Italian or Japanese or Russian, then you could have pointed your mobile telephone at the little QR code that came up there and on your, on your device you would have had a, um, a Russian version or a Japanese version or whatever your, your choice uh, would be. Okay, so my name is Richard Harvey, and what I want to do is talk today about speech technology. In particular, I want to really focus on the business of how to uh, wreck a nice peach, or wreck a nice beach, or recognize speech. And uh, this is part of a series of lectures sponsored by the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists who, uh, amongst other noble things, are interested in promulgating better understanding of how uh, technology works. So uh, this series is all about how modern technology works and I hope by the end of it you will have um, some understanding of how speech processing works. And I want to start, I think, by looking at some acoustic signals. Uh, so here is a conventional way to display an acoustic signal. Um, in the sonar world, this is called an A-scan, and it's a picture of the, um, the voltage or the pressure waveform as a function of time, which is down here on the x-axis. And up here is a frequency representation known as a spectrogram, which I'm going to explain later on. And this is time along here, and what we've got up here is frequency. Um, would anyone care to speculate as to what this might be? might be, I mean, it could be whale song or um, a steam engine or uh, some spoken speech or some music. Um, yes, I think you're wise to not speculate, ladies and gentlemen, actually. I mean, it, it, it's very, it's not easy, is it? Um, a, a rough rule of pattern recognition, actually, is that if humans can't immediately see the pattern by looking at something, then it's probably quite a hard problem. So. My, I'm inviting you to look at this waveform and to know what it sounds like is really one of the more challenging questions that I could ask in this lecture. Uh, well, let's see if we can uh, give you an idea. OK, it's a nice, funky bit of music. Okay, well, uh, top listening for everyone in the audience this evening. I, I have to tell you that I, I have a suspicion that the uh, average age of the physical audience to Gresham's lecture is somewhat different to the average age of the online audience. So uh, not knowing who to please, um, I, I have, some, have some different music for you, you guys later on, uh, speaking to the physical audience. Um, and to the online audience, kids, I'm, I'm down with it, okay? <laughs> Now, some obvious things that you can see there, obviously you can, you can see the spectral content of the symbols, which are happening very regularly here, and they seem to extend up to a considerable uh, part here. This is, uh, the limits of human hearing are generally around uh, 20 kilohertz, um, unless you're over the age of 50, in which case, um, somewhere down here. Um, the, and you can see the rhythmic part of it, but it is not an easy task. Um, here's an alternative um, signal. Would anyone like to guess what this is? 
Okay, well, um, it looks very characteristic to people in the game. Um, this is uh, speech. Okay, so you can see some gaps between here. And on the first looking, you might think those are gaps between words. These, this structure here is very characteristic of human speech, and most of it is below 5 kilohertz. And then uh, this stuff here looks rather non-informational. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Let's just play the clip for you. There seems to be some debate as to whether Sir Thomas Gresham was a nice man or a nasty man. Uh, Either way, he pays my salary. OK, well, whether he was a nice man or a nasty man is actually the topic of another lecture on the history of Sir Thomas Gresham. Um, a couple of things I would like to draw your attention to is that the gaps in this waveform are not necessarily always associated with word gaps. I mean, some of the word gaps are quite small here. I've done a little bit of what's called alignment here, where I've tried to very roughly put the text underneath this. Normally, we would do some sort of phonetic alignment, but I've just done it roughly so you can see uh, what's going on. OK, so that's the problem we're facing, which is, given this pattern, can we work out what on earth is going on? So in order to get through that, I want to talk about quite a few little uh, nasties that get you when dealing with these problems. And the first nasty I think I want to discuss is the problem of going digital. OK, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that this beautiful speech that you're hearing from me now is continuous uh, waveform. It is not a digital quantity. It is not a set of numbers. So I think we ought to talk about how we get from this continuous waveform first to the set, a sequence of digital numbers, and then having got that sequence of digital numbers, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that gets, uh, gets processed. Okay, so let's uh, go through that. And um, I think I've got a little test sequence uh, here. Let's just um, play out, if it will play out. Geese don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. OK, a rather peculiar sentence. It's actually a truncated version of geese don't enjoy the winter weather in Monmouthshire, which is not your everyday bit of conversation, is it? But it's actually phrase 122 from the Messiah, a uh, phonetically balanced data set, and we'll just uh, use it for the purposes of this uh, demonstration. So, uh, obviously, we can um, resample that at different rates. Now, that was sampled at um, 44.1 kilohertz, which is a standard sampling rate for, uh, for acoustic uh, speech for various reasons. That is a sensible sampling rate for the, for the human ear. Uh, and I've illustrated uh, that by this the clip that's on the top uh, right here. Geese. Don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. And I could reduce the sampling rate. Geese don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. Can't really hear any difference between those two. It is at half the sampling rate, so that's 22.05 kilohertz. Um, and now let's reduce it a little bit further down to, oh, I think this is Geese five. don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth starting to hear it uh, get distorted. And then we could also alter the number of bits we're using to represent this. So I think I'm using all the bits. So this was recorded on a 24-bit system, so we could listen to it on a 16-bit system. Geese don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. OK, that's 16, I think. I'm listening carefully to Geese. Him. Don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. That's eight. Geese don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. That's four bits. And then the last one is one bit. That's where um, the signal is clipped to either plus one or minus one. So it's the most f uh, extreme form of distortion. And it will sound terrible. And uh, I think we've got the audio control, so we won't blow your ears out. But uh, it might sound a bit loud. <laughs> Still intelligible, notice. Um, it, it, one bit, which is the worst form of possible distortion you get, is still intelligible. And this is one of the great interests with human speech. You, you are so good at listening to human speech 
that you can put up with almost a, a startling variety of bad things that I do to it. So the magic uh, numbers really for uh, telephony speech, or at least uh, speech on the PSTN, the publicly switched telephone network, are eight and eight. If, so long as we sample it at around 8,000 times a second, or eight kilohertz, and so long as we use eight bits, then it should sound something like this. Oh, it doesn't sound something like that. Geese don't enjoy the drabness of winter weather in Monmouth. And I maintain that is very little different from the original signal that I played you on the previous slide. So, general rule of thumb is that for public switch telephony speech, uh, 8 kilohertz at 8 bits, which is a considerable saving. And if you think when all of these standards were designed, which was, oh, let's think, you know, late 60s, early 70s, there was very good reason to reduce the, number, the, the, number, the amount of information being used to send these things. Uh, mobile telephony uh, generally uses a bit more, um, which is always a surprise to people, given that... Um, the terrible quality of mobile telephone calls around the world. You know, you always seem to... The most common thing I ever say on the mobile telephone is, I can't hear you. And the second most common thing is, can I ring you back? Um, that's nothing to do with the speech coding, of course. That's to do with the uh, general um, poor state of 3G and 4G network. Uh, particularly if, like me, you do not live in this wonderful capital city of London. So... There is a nice theorem which says the general rate at which you need to sample things, and it's called the uh, Nyquist sampling theorem. Um, actually, if you're interested, Wikipedia calls it the uh, Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. In my last lecture, I talked quite a lot about Shannon, so I decided to um, suppress a bit of Shannon this time and talk a bit about Harry Nyquist instead, who was generally regarded as thinking this. Of course, as with all things around 1933, which was when all of this work was going on, um, there was tremendous sort of competition between Americans and Russians, and the Russians are keen to remind you that Vladimir Kotelnikov also invented um, this theorem. And uh, who am I to disagree, uh, particularly as their security services are extremely violent and I wouldn't want to do anything to upset them. Um, so uh, let's now rename it the Kotelnikov sampling theorem. Um, and it says that if a, if a signal has a bandwidth of B hertz, then it can be completely reconstructed by sampling at at least twice that frequency. So that sort of makes uh, sense, doesn't it? I said earlier on in the first slide that I thought human speech probably sort of petered out of information above about four or five kilohertz, so you should be able to sample it at twice that rate, eight kilohertz, and still understand it. And you can. Great, that's all consistent. It's a beautiful theorem, the Nyquist uh, theorem, and if you're uh, you know, wondering what to do or late on a Sunday evening, um, get out the textbooks and have a look at um, the Nyquist sampling theorem. Now, what can we say about those, uh, the choice of uh, numbers of bits to represent the signal that's more difficult. There are not such beautiful theorems relating to those number of bits. Um, generally speaking, um, eight bits seems to be enough for speech, but most of these things are determined by listening to them. So you would not put up with eight bits on your, um, your digital... I was going to say your CD, but I realise, of course, no one listens to CDs anymore. But your digital streaming service of choice, you would not put up with eight bits. And if you're listening to um, BBC Radio 3, you most certainly would not put up with eight bits. Um, however, there is a bit of a problem which is illustrated um, here. If I look at the occupancy of these bits, which is what's shown in this histogram here, speech really doesn't occupy many of the available bits. You get this terribly little sort of spiky distribution, which feels rather inefficient. And in the first lecture I gave, I explained why that was inefficient. It was a bad use of information. So... What we'd often do is we would often artificially boost the quiet bits of the uh, waveform in a process known as expansion, or, or, and the companion of that is called compression. So we'd use either compression or expansion. That leads to this nice new word, companding, which is a, uh, a noun means both com compressing and expanding. And the effect of that is to make the distribution of this somewhat uh, more attractive, so we've managed to 
we've lowered this spike here and we brought up these uh, wings here, which makes it easier to code. And that is very common. And the, again, in the public switch telephone network, uh, that they'll use a law or mu law compounding to make a better use of the bits. Uh, in case you're wondering, I mean, compounding is also um, used as an artistic effect. It's very common in um, music. Uh, and just to, I, I didn't want to play you mu law and a law compounding because it really makes the speech sound terrible. Um, and we only use it to squeeze uh, stuff through n narrow bits of data bandwidth in the system. Um, but I will just quickly play you the effect of compounding. If you're interested in the effect of compounding, I encourage you to listen to BBC Radio 3, which does not use compression, and Classic FM, which I don't know that it does, but it jolly well sounds like it does. And uh, it's very distinctive. Uh, you often hear it on... It's used extensively in commercial music stations because it makes it sound loud, and it makes it sound loud in the car, which is a very important uh, market, I think, for a lot of commercial radio. This is non-compressed. Uh, non and this is compressed. Oh, come on, play. Quite a subtle effect, but feels a bit more beefy. Okay, so all of this goes on in your device of choice, your mobile phone or whatever it is you're using to record the speech. So the first thing that happens is we sample the waveform using that Nyquist theorem to get the sampling rate right, and then we may or may not use some compression to make the best use that we can of the, uh, the bits available to us, and then we squeeze it into a number of bits and use a process known as quantization. Okay, so those are the three basic things. We've now got this continuous waveform has now become a sequence of numbers, and we're going to process the sequence of numbers. Right, one other little bit of preparatory work and then we're, we're good to go. So, in uh, engineering, and particularly engineering, I was going to say computer science, but uh, and computer scientists are famous for knowing not very much about this stuff. Um, it is frequent to use something called the frequency uh, domain to represent things, and it's uh, all known as the Fourier representation, named after Jean-Baptiste uh, Joseph Fourier, um, who, and Fourier showed in 1822 that you could represent waveforms by sums of sines and cosines. Uh, an interesting man, Fourier. He also, also discovered the greenhouse effect quite considerably before anyone else, uh, which just goes to show how engineers are you know, basically superior beings. Um, and I want to illustrate that to you now. Um, so here is a wave, waveform. It's usually called a triangle. Uh, waveform, and I, I've constructed this, and it uh, is a 200 hertz waveform. I want you to give it a good old listen and try and sort of get it in your mind, because we're going to compare various approximations to it. Okay, uh, I guess you would say that doesn't sound like a pure tone, whatever that might mean, um, and you can, you can hear some of that in... The, uh, in the recording. Uh, now, let's have a listen to some alternative versions of this. So now let's listen to a sine wave, which is exactly the same frequency as the triangle wave. So the sine wave here is shown in uh, light blue, and the original triangle wave is shown in, in um, yellow dashes. Okay, so it's exactly the same frequency, but it sounds different. So now I'm going to add to that uh, wave a, another sine wave at three times the frequency of the original. That's the one shown in yellow. And the sum of those two is shown in blue. So you can see the blue waveform looks a bit closer now to the, uh, the triangle wave. And that sounds like this. 
So that's the thing at three times the frequency. And here's the thing at five times the frequency. That was meant to be seven, but I don't think that is seven. I think that sounds like a five to me, but let's... And we keep going. You hear that? You should be able to hear it. It's about three point something kilohertz, 3.8 kilohertz. If you can't hear that, um, go to the audiology department immediately. Um, the, um, and I'm adding these things together, and as I'm adding them together, ah, oh, yes, uh, speech recognition, right. Uh, you can go to the geology department if you like. Um, the, uh, <laughs> they're not very good with ears, but they, uh, they rock. Um, the, um, the triangle... Uh, wave is now appears to be well approximated by this sum of different sine waves. So what I'm describing there is called Fourier synthesis. The idea is that you can add up these sine waves and reconstruct a waveform. It's a very important uh, principle in, um, uh, in, in, in engineering and acoustics. And I can show you that happening as we go. What I'm going to do is, as we move along here, I'm just going to add in more and more of these so-called harmonics, as they're called. These are the things that the multiples. And you should hear the waveform getting progressively closer and closer to the triangle wave that we heard earlier. <laughs> My contention is the thing you heard last was identical to the thing you heard at the beginning. I know it was because I made it so. Um, and what you're seeing along the spectrogram display here is the spectral components of the thing that's playing. So you read this here as frequency. The brightness of this is something to do with energy. And this is time along here. And the spectrogram is the sort of standard display of displaying time frequency waveforms. In actual fact, um, if you're nerdy and in the audience, um, then there are actually, if I, if I hadn't altered the, um, the, the scale here, you could also see some artifacts on the ends of these switches. Um, and that's because uh, these sudden junctions also create, uh, also have to be synthesized by this sum of uh, sine waves and they create some artifacts that you see. What is, why we find this rather beautiful is that there's this uh, equivalence between what we call the time domain, which is the waveform itself, and the frequency domain, which is the energy in all of these sine waves. And that turns out to be very important for us when we're going to recognise speech. And um, I'm just going to sort of let that hang there for a moment, because in a moment I want to go and talk about how we do that recognition. Um, but, of course, you, you might be thinking that if you're going to do speech recognition, what you must do is have a deep and detailed understanding of the way the human voice works. So if you're of that persuasion, then what you will do is you will draw a picture like this, you know, which is some sort of sketch um, of the uh, human uh, vocal tract. And I'd sort of draw out to you a couple of things that, here that are material. The first thing that happens is when you speak, you generate some uh, air in your lungs, and you can feel that. That's the diaphragm working, and you blow it up through these vibrating things here, which are called the vocal cords. And you have little muscles in those vocal cords, so you can change the frequency of the vibration. Um, and then it goes through these cavities, and these cavities can be also be changed. I can move my tongue, I can move my uh, jaw, and so on, and that affects the sound I'm hearing. Uh, and it's rather fascinating to see it in action. Uh, there aren't many examples of this. It's a bit difficult to cut someone open uh, and ask them to speak. But there are two things you can do. One is called electromagnetic articulography, which is where you um, fit little coils inside people's mouths. Uh, and that's quite a fun thing to do. I mean, it's not fun if you're doing it. Obviously, having super glued coils to the roof of your mouth is not very pleasant, um, but it allows you to measure some of these motions. Or you can put yourself in an MRI machine and, um, sorry, an NMR machine and create a movie. 
And that's what I've got here. Uh, this is a movie from, uh, ooh, um, I think it's the T Timit sequences, and you can download it online. I'm sorry, it's low resolution. That's the, that's the technology that we've got. And this person's just going to speak to us in a moment. I'd encourage you to have a quick look at the tongue, um, which is here. It's incredibly mobile and interesting, the tongue. They were quite surprising. This was easy for us. Jane may earn more money by working hard. She is thinner than I am. Bright sunshine shimmers on the ocean. Nothing is as offensive as innocence. Nothing is as offensive as innocence. I always gets me that, that phrase, um, but it's a stand, one of the standard test phrases in um, in Timmy. Um, did you see how flexible and amazingly mobile the the tongue was? When I saw this first, I had no idea that my tongue was so good at uh, moving in such um, interesting ways. And um, a sort of simple model that I, uh, people like to think about is um, for the human voice is a sort of trumpet. Okay, so. You've got this energy term here, and that's how much you're breathing out. And then you've got this excitation term here, that's the vocal cords, the, um, uh, what do you call that in trumpet players? It's called the embrasure, it, it, the, the lip shape, okay? Um, and then the modulation, which is, uh, you, you press these things to make different notes, and then out comes the speech waveform here. Now, one of the beauties of using the Fourier domain is that actually the modelling of all of this is rather complicated, but in the Fourier domain, in the frequency domain, it's just a product. It's the energy times the excitation multiplied by the modulation, and that's the, that's the signal. It's a very simple model for speech, and uh, it's rather uh, delightfully simple and something that we will, um, you know, we, we will use. Now, um, I suppose at this point I should say that it is possible to give 10, 20, 30, 40 hours of lectures on the human voice, phonetics, and how the physiognomy of the, uh, the human works when it comes to speech production. And although they're very interesting lectures, I don't, I don't have time to do that. But I would like to point out um, one thing, which is not about speech production, it's all about the ear. And when you're designing a pattern recognition system, you're looking for clues, really, not only in the signal, but you might also be looking for clues in the way we do things. Well, we're very good at listening to speech. You know, we're evolved to listen to speech. So if the ear does something, then you might have a clue that that tells you something about the way you should do recognition. Now, I've just got one of those clues for you to just ponder, because it's quite a fun one. Um, OK, so on the top here is my old friend, the, uh, the triangle waveform. OK, and on the bottom here is a completely different waveform. Who in the audience thinks that these will sound different? I'm amazed that you don't. I mean, they look completely different. If you want to know, what's actually happened here is I've taken the third harmonic of this waveform and I have inverted it, so I have made a phase change to the waveform. And so let me just play you the sound of both of these. That's our old friend, the triangle. And here's the weird, uh, funny-looking waveform at the bottom. Identical. The ear is not sensitive to phase. So the shape of the waveform doesn't matter when it comes to speech recognition. That's quite good. Only the frequency components seem to matter. OK, now, there's a slight danger here, which is I've sort of alluded to. One is that we could spend a lot of a lecture discussing these things. But there's also um, a little bit of controversy. And I always feel all Gresham's lecture ought to have a little bit of controversy in the Mars. We aren't really tackling the topic. And the, the controversy is probably best uh, enunciated by Fred Jelinek, who died in 2010, and um, Jelinek worked for a long time on uh, building speech recognition uh, systems. In fact, Steve Young, the great, um, great speech professor at Cambridge, described him as not a pioneer of speech technology, as the pioneer of speech technology. And you can see he doesn't think very highly of linguists in this quote. And he's not actually being rude about linguists. 
well, actually, he might have been rude about linguists, but the point he's trying to make is that there's a fundamental tension when you're designing a recognition system between the desire to learn everything, so what you do then is you get masses and masses and masses of data, and you just learn stuff, and the desire to use your built-in knowledge, your scientific knowledge about how things work. It's very important, this, and it runs throughout the history of artificial intelligence. Um, and we're going to look at it in a later lecture, actually. We're going to look at something called deep learning, which is the, uh, the absolute um, favourite machine learning technique of, of, of all uh, artificial intelligence people. And the deep learners strongly believe you just learn everything, don't bother about knowledge. And more sensible people, like me, think there is a place for some understanding of the subject. Right, well, that brings us on quite nicely to what the... Um, uh, classifier looks like. So this is it at block level. I've talked a little bit about this part, the capture bit. I haven't talked about this. This seems to be a sort of magic part that I'm very delicately evading for the time being. Um, and then this is the classifier. And the classifier might typically build some sort of model of each one of this, let's say, words, and it would allow you to pick the most probable model given the signal. Most modern classifiers essentially play the odds on the basis of uh, what they've seen before. So this, this, this if I just uh, reveal what's inside the classifier, I've got all these models, and model one says, well, I think I'm 95% certain it's me, and the next one says, no, no, I think it's 3% certain to me, and so on and so on and so on. So recognition just consists of choosing the most probable model given the data. Of course, there's a just. It implies a lot of training, a lot of technical uh, expertise and so on. Right, so what goes in this box? Well, there are choices. There are always choices in life and um, there are quite a few possibilities. The two ones that are in common use are linear predictive coefficients, uh, which I'm not going to talk about because time is short, and what are called MFCCs, male frequency capstraw coefficients. I don't want to spend too long on these, but I do want to say a little bit about them because they do give you an insight into how speech recognition works. And this looks like a complex bit of processing chain, but actually it's been quite well developed thinking about the way the human ear works and the way, of course, the voice works. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to block it up into uh, blocks or frames, as they're called. They're usually around 25 milliseconds long. We're then going to do that Fourier analysis bit, which I was talking about here. And we're going to do that because we know the ear tends to respond to uh, frequencies. We're going to throw away the phase because we're not interested in the phase because the ear is insensitive to phase. And then we're going to uh, uh, sum it into uh, filter bands. And those filter bands aren't going to be evenly spaced. They're going to be unevenly spaced. And they're going to be unevenly spaced in something called a male scale, which is a nonlinear scale. They get wider as we go up. And the reason they have that shape is because that is the shape that the cochlear uh, processes in the human ear. So this is a sort of model, again, of the human ear uh, system. Then we're going to take the log. Oh, what the hell is that doing there? Well, the log, if you remember, I said when I was talking about the trumpet model, I said that there was this multiplication effect going on. There was the uh, power, the excitation, the modulation. Well, a multiplication under a log becomes an addition. So that enables the machine learning system to separate better these various components, which you think might help it do the classification a little bit better. And then we do something really wacky and groovy, which is we take the Fourier transform, the spectrum of the spectrum, double spectrum. Well, a double spectrum deserves a special word. It's called the Kepstrom. Um, and we're going to do that because the human voice has all these repeats in it, right? all these harmonics. So if the things are repeating, I'm only interested in the distance between them. I don't really interested in all these repeats. Now, that might feel, you might feel that all sounds a bit ad hoc. And it, um, uh, it, yes, I suppose that is a criticism, although it's probably fair to say that 40 years of continuous development and, and work have led people to believe that this is basically quite a good system. And it is biologically motivated. Ultimately, with all of these things, though, the proof is in the testing. Uh, you generate huge amounts of data, you test it, and you see which one works, works best. It's what uh, engineers call a bake-off, um, and 
not to be confused with the British television uh, programme Bake Off. No soggy bottoms are involved in the, um, our work. So let's see how this works. I've got three um, utterances here, which are the English word sir, actually chopped out from the words uh, Sir Thomas Gresham. And um, uh, let me just, I'll play, play them through and then we can uh, have a little chat about them. Sir. It's rather disturbing, isn't it, having me say sir mysteriously from the dark three times. First thing to say is, look, these are three utterances from me of the same word, sir, and they're not the same. Right? That's the first problem, challenge of speech recognition. You can see that they're really rather different to look at if you scan your eyes across here. These are the energies in those filter banks here, and there's these large, great regions of what appears to be no information, and this is, are the MFCCs. And the nice thing, from my perspective, about these MFCCs is that this large, great lump here has just been compressed into a small little thing here. These look quite informational. Now, they've all got different time scales, OK? Now, you can't have everything. You know, you, you, we would love it if a feature was magic to be magically able to vary in time. Uh, in fact, that hasn't proved to be possible, so we're going to need a classification architecture that can deal with the time variation. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Now, these then are the features. Okay, so for each time here, we have a vector of numbers called a feature vector. And you'll often hear people refer to this as a feature space. And uh, I just want to illustrate briefly why that is called a feature space. So here we've got an utterance. Here we've got the MFCCs, which I'm going to use as the features. And of course, ultimately, they're numbers. So in here, we have some numbers. Um, so we might just have a quick look in there. And here are the numbers. And what I might do then is plot those numbers. I've just picked three. Obviously, there are uh, 20 or so, uh, 12 or so here. We'd usually use more than that in a professional speech recognition system, but I'm just using a small number for illustration. So we might plot those on three axes like this. Um, so let me just do that. So when people talk about a feature space, what they mean is uh, a set of axes. Now, I'm using three because three was the limit of my visualization ability, uh, but it would be 20 or 60 or whatever we're using. And we'll do that again. So we would uh, take the next set of numbers and we would plot them. And then they form this trajectory. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but let me just pick, say, the blue line, which represents one utterance of sir. It sort of goes around here, wiggles around here for a bit, wiggle, 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 wiggle. Uh, then it comes over here, wiggle, 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 and it comes back here again. Now, these are all, these are three different utterances of this word, sir. And there, it looks a bit confusing, but there are, I think, some interesting observations that you can make already. And I've sort of drawn them out here. To my mind, there's some separate sort of clusters. There's a cluster of things here, and we can see some wiggling about in this cluster. And then there's one over here. And there's one over here. And pretty much they all start here, go over here, wiggle, 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 go over here, wiggle, wiggle, and back get down here again. So the word sir, you can think of as this sort of wiggling around these little clusters. So if we had a pattern recognition system that was able to model these movements through these clusters, we'd have solved the speech recognition problem. Yay! Well, that is a fantastic uh, place to point out that such a system does exist um, and uh, mathematicians call it a Markov model and a Markov model is a set of states that you're going to transit through and the idea is you're going to start over here and then as you move along these arrows you have choices and associated with each one of these arrows I haven't shown them are probabilities so maybe you have a probability of point Eight, you go this way, you have a probability of, say, point 0.1, you go this way, and probably point 0.1, you go this way. So you can see in the, in, what you get, you get into each one of these states, you roll your dice according to the odds, and then you progress 
from left to right. Okay, so this is called a left to right uh, Markov model. So if I just run the model for, for a little example, um, we might start here, and off we go. One, two, 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 three. So that would be the sequence uh, one, one, two, two, three. I, think, I hope I got that right. Um, and if we run the model again, because it's random, uh, we will get a different sequence. Okay, that took a different path through the model, but it was still left to right. So these, uh, you can, you, can you see how that might be useful for the model I was thinking about of the waveform? You're bouncing from each one of these states to the next state. We're possibly you're allowed to stay in the state, so, you, so I might stay here for a bit. Oh, I'll bounce along to the next one, the next one, the next one. That's the basis of the Markov model idea. Okay, well, we need one little tweak, I think, to... Um, make it really work for us, and that is called the hidden Markov model. So the hidden Markov model has one little tweak, which is at each one of these states, I am going to allow myself to emit something. Maybe a symbol, as in this case, because it's easier to visualise symbol, but it might be a number. So we now have the basis of, I think I was about to say all, and I just questioned, yes, I think all effective modern spe speech recognition. It's the hidden Markov model. Um, usually takes um, four, four or five hours to explain the hidden Markov model to people in great detail, so well done for comprehending that in a few seconds. Um, and the idea is, um, so we would run the model, and out comes my little thing. It's taking a different path, I think, this time. Oh, no, the same path. And now we have an output sequence. The output sequence is one or other of these things, and there are probabilities associated with these as well. Uh, we might say maybe B is more probable than G, and G is B, uh, here G is more probable than B, and here there is only one thing that comes out, which is R. So technically this bit isn't hidden at all. If I see R, I know I must be in state 3, but if I see B, I can't tell whether I'm in state, two, uh, state 1 or state 2. Okay, so that's the basis of the hidden Markov model. So you might think of the R, G, and B here as being associated with the colours of those little clusters that I uh, drew on my little diagram. So how does this work then? Right, well, there's a great big gap, which I'm not going to cover, which is you can train these things. Okay? And what you do is you get lashings and lashings of uh, acoustic recordings. You label them up with... Uh, so you say, this is the word Sir, this is the word Thomas, this is the word Gresham. You build a model for each one of those. You run them each in models, you pick the most probable one, and that's your transcription. That's if you're doing word recognition. If we're doing English language recognition, as we are, as well, Microsoft are gamely doing uh, as, we, as we speak, you can't learn every word in the English language. So what, in fact, you learn are the phonemes, the components of those words. There are 44 phones, roughly, in British English, well, it depends which linguist you speak to, but let's say 44. Um, and silence, so that makes 45. So what you do is you build a model for each one of those, and then you get a phonetic sequence out of your, um, your, your, uh, your, 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 your recognizer. Okay, so it might look something like this. I, I've actually mocked this up for, for good reason. So you might have some phrase like this, and... Um, out comes the transcription here. I'm sure you're all familiar with the International Phonetic Alphabet, so you've all immediately decoded uh, that. Anyone know? Uh, OK, well, I'll leave it as a little surprise. You can sit there and work it out in a moment. Um, one thing to point out, and this one is errorful, OK? There are some errors here and here. I thought it was too easy just to read the phonetic sequence, so I'll make it more difficult by throwing in some errors. I think it's true to say that there are massive amounts of errors if you tend to do recognition like this, single phones. So in practice, we have to do a whole load of stuff that time is going to sort of stop me from really describing to make it really work. Um, let me pick one of these that I think is really, two really important. The first one is we probably don't recognise just one phone. We might recognise two phones together, three phones, triphones, quad phones, whatever. The, that's called the n-gram system. That 
tends to improve things a little bit. Uh, there is a problem, which is co-articulation, which is the running together of, um, uh, of uh, sequences, which can be quite, um, quite problematic. Um, but, uh, you know, fair, fair, fair enough. Um, uh, and language modelling. Language modelling is probably the critical um, aspect of all modern speech recognition. So language modelling not only knows uh, words in the English language and knows their phonetic uh, component, it also is able to make some description, some uh, guessing at what the sentence might be about. So this speech recogniser at the moment is trying to do that. It's applying all of the possible rules it can possibly think of to try and guess what this noisy sequence of phonemes might be. And it's actually doing quite a good job. Uh, well, I'm sure you've worked out the audio now. Um, I'm playing all the right notes, not necessarily in the right order. OK. Um, the great Eric Morecambe speaking from the grave there. Um, now, so why is it tricky? Well, it's tricky because we've got all these parameters, and I've talked about some of them already. You know, numbers of speakers here. Um, this is a, a, one of Ben Milner's slides here, I think. A uh, number of words. So typically we want to, you know, users, people like you and me, we want to work out here. We want to work with hundreds of speakers. We want to work with fluent speech. We want to work in noise. We want to work across different accents and all of those things. All of those things imply lots and lots of... Uh, difficult, difficult experimental conditions, which are a real challenge for speech recognition. So, this, um, I'm sorry this slide is so complicated, there was a famous slide that once described the, um, the actors and processes in the Iraq war, and General Stanley McChrystal, when he saw this slide, said, by the time we've understood this slide, we will have won the war. And I feel a bit like this, but I think it's fairly easy to describe. What um, these guys here plotted uh, by, by year the performance of all known speech recognition systems in terms of WER, the word error rate. A couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to. This is the range of human transcription error, according to them, between 2 and 4%. I don't know if you've been watching the, um, descript the uh, online speech recognition, but I, I think it's not running at 2 to 4%, and there's very good reasons for that. Um, which we, we might get a chance to cover. Uh, and what's happening here, you see that somebody develops some data and then scientists work on it and the error rate goes down. And then it gets too easy and somebody thinks of some other task. And so the first thing to remember is the task keeps changing. Right? So it's very common in science, particularly recognition science, for somebody to say, oh, I got 4% on that data set. And the, you, what data set? because it makes a big difference. Um, now, some of these are quite challenging. Um, you notice this one up here is switchboard, which is a conversational speech over telephone channels between two North Americans. So that's a very difficult uh, test, isn't it? I'll just play you a bit, and you can be appalled at how difficult the test is. Let's see how good the speech recognizer is. Oops. Something rather erotic about that conversation, I think, but <laughs> maybe I'm, you know, maybe your own gardening is uh, something of interest to you. Now, where is this all going? Okay, a couple of things to say. Uh, the first thing to say is that uh, people in academia are rapidly leaving speech recognition, either to go and work for very large salaries for one of these companies, or retiring, or they're moving on to some other problem. And the reason is that all of the language models, all of the, it's, it's becoming commercial. Huge teams are involved in order to do these uh, systems, and it's more and more difficult to build an academic speech recogniser. The state of the art at the moment is still these hidden Markov models, but they use a form of deep learning to model that hidden bit. Okay? And uh, something coming up out of nowhere, much to my surprise, is a form of recognition called end-to-end -end recognition, where we do actually look at the waveform. We ignore all about feature extraction process. 
For the reasons I've talked about, I am not super optimistic that that will be the ultimate solution to the problem. That said, you know, despite that, so that, that means that if you're working in speech recognition, my advice, as an academic, my advice would be don't go and do something else. Um, there are still quite a lot of problems, and that's what people are turning to, sort of problems to do with accent and noisy speech and so on. And let me give you a sort of little illustration of some of these uh, complexities with a nice exhibit I found at the um, San Francisco, uh, my friend actually, Stephen Cox, found this at the San Francisco Exploratorium. Now, ladies and gentlemen, would anyone like to tell me what this is about? You're all native, uh, well, you're not all native English speakers in this audience, but most of you, I believe, are familiar with the English language. Um, shall I give you a clue? Ladle Rat Rotten Hut. Once upon term, Der worsted ladle gull who lift with her murder in her ladle cordage on her itch of her lodge dog florist. Disc ladle gull orphan worry ladle cluck with her putty ladle rat hut. And for disc raisin, pimple called her ladle rat rotten hut. Okay, so there we go. That was little rat rotten hut. Um, obviously, the, the point that's being made here is that the intonation and stressing, which is very important in the English uh, language, uh, can have uh, a semantic uh, meaning to you all. So if I said, um, I thought she was married, for example, wasn't a phrase, we would all understand that the phrase, I thought she was married, is completely different from I thought she was married. I thought she was married, I thought she was married, and I thought she was married. They're all different. Uh, and you know it, they're different. And Dealing with some of these sort of meta-linguistic uh, issues are, is, um, you know, interesting and quite problematic. I'd also like you just to draw your attention to another possibility, which um, well, I particularly like to do this because I work on this. Speech is also visual. As you're listening to me now, you are aiding your speech recognition by looking at my lips. You might not think you're doing this, but you are. And one of the first people to notice this was a guy called Ben Franklin. I'm sure you know, you know, had something to do with the American Constitution. But more important than that, he invented bifocals, and he found that once he put on his bifocals, he could speak French a lot better. And this is a very uh, common observation. So everyone in this audience lip reads to some degree, and I can demonstrate that for you with a very nice uh, effect called the McGurk effect. I'm going to play you a video of me. And I'd like you to um, firstly look at that video and work out what I'm saying, which is usually not very tricky. So let's have a go at that. Oh, sorry, yeah, I should have said. Um, Benjamin Franklin, my favorite quote is, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. So um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite uh, gentlemen. Okay, so uh, let's, let's have a look at this clip. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, so most people, when they see that clip, would hear something like da 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 da. Um, now I'd like you to look at that clip again, but I'd like you to close your eyes, and you'll hear something different. Ba 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 ba. So when I close my eyes, I hear ba 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 ba. And when I open my eyes, I hear da, 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 da. And that's because I fooled you. The video is actually me, I think, saying ga, 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 ga. And the audio is ba, 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 ba. And your brain is fusing the two systems and coming up with some sort of weird, uncomfortable noise that's for some people in this audience will be va, some people will be da, some people will be ta. Anyone not see it? Ah, oh, right. Straight down to the psychiatric ward for you two. Uh, okay, um, you don't always see it, um, but do have a look. Uh, YouTube has some very good uh, illustrations of this, and better, better than this. So, uh, oh, shut up, Richard. Now, um, so lip reading is quite challenging, but it is not a lost hope. And here's an example of a little bit of um, lip reading um, of two colleagues. This is us building a. Um, 
the keyword recognizer, looking for American cities, and I've picked this clip because people often say that lip reading is impossible without all the right conditions. Um, so let's give it a go. Okay. San Antonio and Phoenix. And I remember it in, in Phoenix, I stayed in, in uh, quite a nice hotel, I think the Hilton. And there was a special on offer for dinner, a shark taco. So being adventurous, I thought I'll, I'll try this. Which sounds quite, quite interesting. And then I... I Went on to, to, um, uh, I feel terribly and sorry I, for this I poor guy who's caught in the back of this video. And I told um. my uh, colleagues there, uh, I think it was because I had Chad Taco in, uh, in Phoenix, and I uh, by this time I had recovered, and they, they'd never heard of a Chad Taco, and mentioned it. Okay, well I think we've had enough about the Chad Taco. Um, but there's an example of a lip reading system. And the idea behind lip reading is obviously there are a few specialized circumstances when you want to purely lip read, um, but you're really interested in lip reading as an augmentation to audio recognition, audio visual recognition. So this is uh, a little illustration of how good or poor that is. And one way of comparing your automatic performance is with humans. So this is a human forensic lip reader, and we've plotted them on two axes. This is their word accuracy, and this is their phoneme accuracy uh, down here. And what you would expect with a lip reader is that when you give them some training data, so you give them the uh, vocabulary that you're using, that their performance um, increases, uh, which it did in this case. I would draw your attention to the fact that this is zero word accuracy, though this is a professional forensic lip reader. They were all done anonymously, I don't know who they are, but they were running at zero uh, accuracy, which is slightly alarming, isn't it? Uh, here's the, another one, and they improve as you would hope. Here's another one, and they didn't improve at all as we go from some training. Here's another one, and they didn't improve. Here's another one, and they got worse, uh, dis <laughs> despite being trained on the data. Uh, now, here's the best person we've ever tested, and they did indeed get better, which is very nice. And in 2012, this was our computer system. So this is compared to forensic lip readers. So still some way to go, but some potential, I hope. OK, so that brings us to the end. And... The story of speech technology, in particular speech recognition, has been highly incremental and uh, very, very slow. And in fact, that gives me some comfort. It means that you know, there's been a lot of people working on this, and the gains that have been made are very solid. Most of the effective implementations are currently in the hands of commercial providers at the moment. I don't say that's a bad thing or a good thing. I just say it's a thing. Um, I would say this lecture has probably steered us to thinking, well, we probably ought to understand a bit more about machine learning and just to big up the fact that there is a lecture on that in the, in the series, so I'd encourage you to come to that. And further work also needed on visual processing, uh, something that we call vision, and that is, in fact, the subject of our next lecture. So, ladies and gentlemen, there is the list of next lectures. Here is the list of some people who helped me with some of these presentations, and thank you very much. <laughs>